Hello, listeners, and thank you for tuning in to the Batuta Advocate radio show or podcast if you're listening from outside our humble inland town. My name is Errol Parker, and this show is coming out of the capital of the Sunshine State. Yes, my name is Clancy Overall as well. Thank you for listening. Yep, down in Brisbane right now. So if you're listening back home in Batuta on Desert Rock FM, we're glad the audio has made it back to Domantina Shire. We are down here, of course, because of the Batuta Advocate Roadshow is in full swing. We've thoroughly enjoyed meeting the good people who've come out to see us across the northern cities, and now we're heading down south. Yes, it's been great so far, and if you're listening to our show from down south, make sure to come and grab some tickets to see us when we come to your town for the Batuta Advocate Roadshow. Now, this week on the show, we are talking to cricketing royalty, uh, a man who has seen the highest highs of our national team and has since become an institution in the coverage of the game. His name is Ian Healy, and he has done it all. One of our greatest ever players, and today he's going to offer up some insight into what's currently going on in the game. That, and we're about to have a chat with Ian in his office, uh, which is above one of his many car washes. So there's a bit of background noise and a few toots here and there. Yes, on top of Hoppy's car wash. Uh, down in Norman Park. He's got them all over town. Uh, if you live in Brisbane, and uh, yeah, he's got a lot going on. Let's have a chat about it all. Yeah, let's get into it. Well, here we are in uh, Brisbane City. As the Batuta Advocate Roadshow continues around the country, uh, all 13 dates currently in Brisbane now, in um, the breathtaking Griffith Electorate, sitting here with uh, an icon of uh, Australian cricket and um, and Brisbane in itself, Ian Healy. How are you, mate? Very well. Nice to have you, fellas. Thanks for having us over. I only found out yesterday that it was the Griffith Electorate, actually. (laughs) (laughs) It's been a while since I've had Kevin Rudd's head blasted everywhere around here, I guess. (laughs) So we're up here on the top floor of your car wash. Um, there's been a few developments down there in, uh, in the big smoke down there in Sydney uh, at uh, Cricket Australia. Mm. Is, there, uh, is there any way they could kind of lure you out of the car wash game and, <laughs> and down onto the board, you know, to right the ship? Well, no, I'm not right in the mood for punishment just yet. Uh, yeah. I'll stay with the car wash. Uh, no, we, we've got this car wash group, which which occupies our time and my time outside of commentary, which is great, and also the Greek Chapel Cricket Centre, yep. uh, where we've got eight, eight or nine stores around the country now. Um, so uh, I've got plenty on my plate. The broadcasting uh, double up started to become an issue for Mark Taylor, you know, yeah. the, even though he'd been there 13 years and he, <laughs> he wasn't involved in the broadcasting rights deal. Um, but all of a sudden that became a, you know, a conflict of interest. So I'd have the same conflict, I'd imagine. So getting into that board mightn't be uh, possible. Fox Fox is um, now the new kids on the block. Yeah. How's that all looking? Yeah, well, it looks fantastic. The the energy level and the in- intensity and excitement around uh, the Fox offices is uh, something to experience. You know, we, we've been down there a fair bit doing promos and, and wardrobe and photographs and those sorts of things. And, uh, gee, it's a busy, hectic place, which is great. You know, my uh, history and knowledge is only Channel 9, which are separated a lot in cottages, you know, each yeah. of the departments. So uh, when you put it all in one building, wow, there's plenty happening. So it, it was great. They're certainly uh, making a huge effort. They're throwing a lot of people at it, which means a lot of money. And uh, let's see what they produce. Yeah, right. I suppose the culture there would be a bit different to the early days of Channel 9, where you had a uh, big overlord of Kerry Packer there, you know. <laughs> breathing down your neck well i think it might be quite similar yeah you, you know um patrick delaney the the head of fox has certainly uh, got got his fingerprints into it and yeah. he and i know uh, even uh, lachlan murdoch has asked a few questions um and then the head of sports steve crawley has come out of uh, a lot of a lot of uh, networks that have started things up yeah so i think uh, that that has everyone on tender hooks um and and they're really really desperate for it to work um and so what what will make it work is Australia playing good cricket and yeah. uh, being something we w- really want to watch and um, that they've got to make those steps on the field at the moment. But I think, uh, yeah, yeah, the the unknown and and the expense that they're going through at the moment 
probably rivals, uh, you know, the, the early 80s uh, yeah. when the Packer era began. The revolutionary kind of uh, era of World Series and that kind of stuff. You think that you can see some uh, parallels happening now there, down there in Fox? Yeah, I reckon. Um, and I'm not, and I can't, you can't really say much. They, they don't, yeah. I'm lucky to be there because they, they don't want to do things differently and, and claim that they're doing things differently to the way Channel 9 have done it for 40 years and have Channel 9 people all over it. So, so I've just shut up and uh, let, let, it, let it ride, you know. Uh, they're, you know, they're probably doing things, uh, you know, with... with uh, uh, you know, no holds barred, which Channel yeah. 9 would have started doing, then they would have found the shortcuts and the corners to cut and expenses to save. So uh, it's it's really, really interesting and, and great that uh, they've looked after me. Now, did you ever think as a young man playing cricket for Australia uh, that you'd end up having to hang out with these blokes for the rest of your life? Because, you know, there's a lot of crossover between the teams you've played in and the commentary teams you now sit with. That- yeah, and I guess that'll happen if you ever have success. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're into the sort of second generation of success now, if you like, you know, Ponting Gilly and uh, those types of blokes coming through the commentary now. McGrath snuck himself in there, and I think Gillespie's going to do a bit. So, <laughs> so uh, no, you, you probably don't think of that you're going to hang out uh, and work work together, yeah. but but it doesn't surprise me that it happens, uh, and it's good fun. You yeah. know, um, cricket's always had the the no dickhead rule, mm-hmm. and uh, good teams will weed them out. And it's there's very few, no, there's none in my in my time of playing that uh, you know you wouldn't want to hang out with and, and that's probably no coincidence we were pretty successful when you guys are really hitting your straps you know Warney um, McGrath kind of what happens when, when there's that much talent and that much success do you guys you feel like you're kind of not even touching the ground at times or yeah it's a good good description actually it is you, you float around the world yeah. uh, having fun mm. and yet you're doing something significant for your country yeah. and you don't understand uh, how much esteem we all get as a country out of a great sporting performance. Mm-hmm. Um, but you only have to look at India to know the, the esteem a, a country can achieve. Um, yeah. So, And our Olympic performers, all that sort of stuff, we, we just love it. Mm-hmm. But you don't realise that when you're playing. You've, you've just got uh, a singular focus, and, that, and that's a pretty simple plan which enables you to cope with pressure and get the job done. Um, our... Our golden years in my time was 93 to 97, I reckon. Uh, from 88 to 93, we sort of built up our confidence. I think they they picked character, and I liken it to what they're doing right now. Um, so they picked uh, blokes with temperament that and a sense of humour that even though the early years mightn't be that great, they'll, they won't lose confidence. And I would have been one of those selections. Didn't know it. I, I just was a surprise selection. Um, and then when that temperament, becomes comfortable your talent comes out um, you've, of course you've got to be talented um, and have the, the right skills to to emerge and be uh, worthy of playing for Australia so uh, our skills came out sort of uh, early 90s uh, we surprisingly won the 89 Ashes then in the early 90s we started to get really comfortable and Border became a great captain uh, and then then we got a young McGraw and a young Warren that helps yeah. <laughs> coming in coming into the fray and and by about 93 Warren was hitting his straps you know the two bo- war boys Taylor and Slater at the top I was going well uh, our bowlers whether it be Merv Hughes um, or Bruce Reed early in those years uh, were, were going great McDermott so we had everything you know and and didn't worry about any conditions, didn't worry about anything other than simply getting it done on any given day and having fun. You, you've got to have that a really uh, bright passion for what you're doing too and uh, and that should be obvious. Um, and I look back on some photographs uh, only recently actually on, on our team shots, our dressing room shots and on the field shots and it's just full of obvious passion that we love being there. So the talent came through. I reckon between the years 93 to 97, Warney wouldn't have bowled 50 bad balls a year. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It was just, we were just so hard to get on top of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was really a good time oh. for cricket in Australia. We all remember it. <laughs> Speaking of Alan Border, though, he's been, he's been out on the road for Fox for, for a long, long, long time. Him and BJ have been out uh, yeah. sort of doing the hard yards and now... Uh, and now their channel's grown into some sort of huge, huge cricket 
conglomerate now, I suppose it's kind of got a little bit of parallels with how they kind of rebuilt the cricket team themselves, I guess. Yeah, yeah no, like no, out bad. of the dark ages of, of just getting <laughs> flogged all through the early 80s up to betting. <laughs> Up to being the world champions for twenty years. So what you're saying is, Border is just a whipping boy. He is. No, I was really, I was really pleased for for yeah. them that uh, Fox were able to get into cricket uh, full time. Yeah. Um, because they have done a great job. Uh, on, on my last tour, the late nineties, Foxtel were on our shirts. Though Foxtel were our sponsors, and so they've been involved in cricket yeah. over twenty years. And uh, now they've they've got the lot. Um, yeah. And it's great that BJ and, and AB can uh, be a big part of that. Imagine if they didn't bring him on. Yeah, Imagine yeah. Imagine if they were AB and B, you're finished. Yeah, thank you for your service, <laughs> gentlemen. I'm sure we'd hear about it. Right straight. So. <laughs> You'd hear about it at a few corporate lunches, I reckon, yeah. anyway. <laughs> They'd be speaking at most of them. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, you uh, you came out of uh, Brisbane State High. Uh, you know, uh, Wally Lewis, same, um, same kind of um, alumni coming out of there. Matt Tamour. Was there ever a point in your life where you were a bit like a Jason Little? Was it all, or was it always going to be cricket? <laughs> it was all, always going to be cricket, yeah. I reckon. Yeah. Uh, before I went to State High, and he went to State High for one year. Right. Year twelve, I was in the country. Yeah. So as Little a con- yeah, yeah, as a country kid, uh, cricket, the cricket system allowed me to compare myself as a cricketer to the state kids all around city and country. Uh, every year, so I knew I was a really good cricketer compared to everyone else, or you know, top top rung type stuff. And then, but football wasn't the case. You know, I didn't. There wasn't a state carnival every year, or that I knew about, or my town was exposed to. I'm not sure, um, but state high did make me play footy yeah. uh, in year 12. So I, I played. I'd given up league at 16, really, uh, in the country, but came to Brisbane State High, and of course they're in the GPS competition, and I played one year of uh, rugby. Uh, I was a f- halfback in league. Right. They moved me to yeah. five eight because I could set up some play, it would not just be a passer. And I was a kicker. And after one game against Auckland Grammar, my first game in rugby was against Auckland Grammar at Powerhouse School in New Zealand. <laughs> Got smashed, <laughs> and they worked out I was too slow for five eight, yeah. so I had to go inside centre. Right, so right. which is fine. You, you know, you do three tackles a match and you get player of the season. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But it was great. It was a great experience to be able to play that GPS uh, year, and uh, we we did pretty well. Could you see any noticeable differences coming from um, you know up north, Billawheeler way, um, in the way they play cricket in the bush compared to when you came down to the city? Um, not really. No, I, I didn't notice it because I didn't play junior cricket down here. Right. I, I probably and uh, a high level of my cricket a high amount of my cricket from 14 years of of age upwards was senior cricket in the country and senior representative cricket so I got well looked after out there they they saw some potential they knew I was representing um, well outside my town and so the men looked after me too yeah. um, they got me into rep teams early and uh, d- didn't do a whole lot but um, and, and then when I came down to Brisbane I was straight into third grade uh, in club cricket in Brisbane, so I'm not sure how how the junior cricket differed. Um, but yeah, the, the third grade and club cricket was right right on. It was hard, and uh, yeah, you had to be sharp each, each day if you wanted to progress. So, how many games of club did it take you to get up to uh, up to your state? Because uh, you were only in the state team for about half a season, weren't you? And then you yeah, I, on the I was in. Plane. Well, the first question, how many... Well, my career stats are 119 tests, I think 41 Shield games, yeah. and about 60 club games. <laughs> so, And I reckon I'd played 50 of those club games before I'd played for Australia, yeah. you know. So um, so I would have played a club that, that, as soon as I got down to Brisbane, then I went to year 12, played school cricket, and then the next year, I played second grade uh, for Norths in Brisbane. Then the following year, probably went into first grade. By then, I was sort of 20. Then I went, no, I'd had a season in another club, actually, because I was in second grade at Norths. Yep. Our first grade week keeper organised me to go to a Easts, uh, which is here around this area where we are in the electorate of Griffith. <laughs> and uh, I played a season or two for Easts yep. uh, so that I could be playing first grade when Australian under-19 selection came about. Right. They liked to pick 
blokes who were at least playing first grade, you know. So I did that and then went back to North. So And then in the state squad, and a year after that, I would have got into the state squad and then eventually... Uh, the next year after that, uh, the state keeper, Peter Anderson, number yep. one wicket keeper, got injured and I played two Shield games. Then the following year, 1987 or something, uh, he got injured again and gave me four games for Queensland and then they picked me for Australia. They, I leapfrogged him as well as everyone else in the country yeah. to play for Australia. So. My son's now a wicket keeper, and I say to him, it's easy. It's all you've got to do. <laughs> <laughs> he might not be having the luck I had. No. A lot of the games you've played on paper, were the majority were for Australia? Yeah, yeah, I reckon. I've, I've probably, then I played 171 days and a lot of tour matches yeah. and first-class games for Australia. Yeah, yeah, big time. Um, so my dream when I was playing for Queensland, I was the second wicketkeeper for Queensland. Yeah. I thought the first wicketkeeper, Peter Anderson, would play for Australia. Then they had to get upset with Greg Dyer, the Australian keeper, otherwise none of us were going to get a game. You know, So, yeah. so I thought Ando might play for Australia and that would give me five games for Queensland every year. <laughs> and, and I was happy with that. And uh, so I think because I had that, um, that dream, mm-hmm. uh, when I was catapulted in, I was half a chance. You know, I, I sort of had my head into taking a step up. I might as well do this step. Yeah. Mm. Now, Heels, we're just talking about um, how you were lucky enough um, I mean, off the back of border um, doing the hard yards, I guess you could say, to, to be in one of those teams where there's momentum and then there's just everything's working. Um, it's like every match was like a perfect swing at golf um, on many, most of the time. What, what do you think should be the immediate plan for the current Australian cricket side? Mm. I mean, it's, it's probably hard to give an answer, but do you, no, do you see things that they could help? It's could quite help? easy because yeah. I reckon they are, they're – Right where we were yeah. in the uh, mid to late 80s. I only came in in 1988 and they'd already won the one-day World Cup. So yeah. we were starting to move. But, you know, we walked into bars or restaurants and no one spoke to us. Mm. Like no, no one came out and said, oh, great to have you fellas. I'll buy you a round of drinks or anything like that. Nothing. Mm. So, so, you know, that, and we didn't care. Mm. We, we, we knew we had work to do. So you've got to get together. Uh, you've got to love being there. And you've got to do the hard yards. You've got to train hard. Bobby Simpson just nailed us for, for hours in every facet of play. Our net sessions, uh, he was one coach that could spot a problem that might emerge. You know, if yeah. you're doing this, you just made us aware of something you were doing with the bat um, and and just made you aware of it because in three weeks' time, that could become a problem for yeah. you. Um, and, and then in fielding, short catching, long catching, um, ground fielding, we were ahead of the world. So they've just got to love all that. And they, they've got to love all that. I reckon their talent will come out when, when they're comfortable and they're, they're able to relax and concentrate. I suppose, though, it would be a little bit harder than in the early 90s if just overnight you lost AB and Booney and Craig McDermott like for a whole year you know that'd be a bit hard on you it would be extremely hard you know especially in a successful year you know yeah. if you're on the on the build yeah you might just keep building for another year but but uh if you're in a successful era part of it and three of your legends go or you know yeah. you, you might have you might hit a full stop yeah. um so yeah that, that's really difficult um but again Step up, step yeah. up. Everyone, make sure you do your job. I, I thought, uh, you know, when Cummins and Stark and Hazelwood yeah. are in this bowling attack, everyone thinks we're going to win. Yeah. They forget to step up. Everyone else has got to do their yeah. job. The spinners have got to be perfect. We've got to hold catches. We've got to bat and bat long periods. If plenty's happening with the ball, we've got to do some hard yards uh, yeah. with the bat, you know. So, you know, don't just rely on them. And I think good teams, at times when we lost, it was because we thought, we relied on each other. We'll we'll be right. We've still got yep. Warney, and we'll be right. Yep. And Tugger will get the runs. So, and, and before you know it, on on a bad day, bang, you, you're gone. So, don't rely on anyone. Get your job done yourself. Yeah. And even when you didn't have the best spin bowler in the world in your team, you had the second best in <laughs> Magilla. Yeah, in yeah. Magilla. Yes. You know, so it was a bit of a golden era, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a it was a real golden era. And 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 then I can't you can't uh, forget. In the late 80s, there was plenty of times when we just had normal mortal spinners, Peter Taylor, yeah. Peter Sleep. Yeah. Um, we didn't get an opposition out on the last day. 
You got to remember yeah, that, true, yeah. and that's what this team have to go through all the time, every Test match. Yeah, and and so I, I've got to remember all that. One, I was lucky to be in there. Yes, I might have had the right attitude, and we did some did some good work in there. But I got uh, I was lucky. Um, you can't have everyone so rookie ish. Yeah. Um, but if you are, you got to remember how bad you were when yeah. when uh, when we were struggling. You know, you've got to remember that you guys came back from something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We, we were we started things. They, they've got a chance to do it right now and get it going and be really successful. I, I don't like the fact that our bowlers uh, get rested, get rotated at yeah. a time where they get paid to be out anyway. Like burn them, chew them up, and yeah. uh, you know see if they want to stay. Yeah. Um, you know, injuries seem to be a high high on the communication list at the moment they should be the things that are hidden yeah. um, and and players that play with durability uh, are the ones that become legends yeah. our fast bowlers these days if if they're to play 100 tests it's going to take them 25 years yeah, yeah. so we've, yeah. we've got to we've got to drive some durability into everyone do your fingers ache in the winter? <laughs> no, no, but I'm half a chance. I think they might if I lived in conditions like yeah, yeah. that in would Melbourne. warrant that in Melbourne or England. <laughs> um, uh, Tassie. Yeah, uh, yeah. Every now and then I, I get a few hot spots, but um, I'm half a chance up here, I reckon, in yeah, Queensland. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you, you know, well, always come bodies are cycling yeah. those cars downstairs. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. No, well, my car cleaning career is finished. I did four hours once. <laughs> and, I did, and I prayed there wasn't another car that turning up. <laughs> and I, yeah. I'm the owner. <laughs> now, well, just on that, how they've been resting players and everything. Uh, did you ever play with a broken hand or a finger or something, you know, just because you had a young fella who was up behind you going nip, 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 nip? Yeah, it didn't even bother me whether there was a young player or not. I just wanted to rack up games and yeah. wanted to keep playing. So if I could play, I would play. Yeah. And and in that decision to play, you, you're not, you can't let your team down yeah. and you're not spotted on the bench or in the physio room all match. You know, you've just yeah. got to deal with your own stuff and get, get the job done. Uh, Merv Hughes was a classic. He was the best yeah. we had at uh, playing playing hurt, playing with pain uh, and getting the job done. Yeah. Uh, he didn't let anyone down. But, yeah, broken fingers as a keeper, oh, sure. Um, I'd certainly investigate the ones that could get worse. Yeah. Um, uh, but but re- most likely I didn't x-ray my fingers so that I didn't know what I had. Yeah. And you just treat it like a bruised finger then. It's yeah. ice and yeah. it's strapping and, and uh, good treatment, um, but get out and play. You might not be allowed to do that now. No. So, so we didn't have a doctor. Yeah. We had a physio and, uh, who knew you very well and knew your pain thresholds and knew your ability to do the job uh, yeah. with this particular injury. Um, now a doctor would have to probably rule you out, and they do. They, they rule you out. So I'm pretty sure our cricketers are putting a few things under the mat themselves these yeah. days and not, yeah. not sort of coming totally clean on things like broken fingers. Yeah. Now, we interviewed uh, Matt Rogers the other day, and he, uh, he was talking about, you know... Um, very colourful career for the man between both rugby league and rugby union, and he was saying um, about the modern footballer in both codes, it's a, is a different is a different beast. Um, and he was saying, I mean, he, you know, there's positives and there's, there's negatives. Mm. He was saying he's obviously saying with the Wallabies, there's a bit of a brat culture, um, and there's a lot of you know social social media has changed these guys as yep. well as their kind of you know the way they can supplement their incomes, you know, through social media and that kind of stuff. Have you have you seen that with? The modern cricketer. I mean, they are all very Women's Day friendly nowadays as well. Um, you know, it, it, in your area, you weren't getting paid a hundred grand for showing people photos of your kids. So, uh, have you seen that affect the culture of the of the of the game? Oh, not really, because I just still stay out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't. Are they getting that sort of money? Yeah. Um, so, Leighton and Beck money. Yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, that would change the culture. I think what has changed our cricketing culture. Our, First of all, our cricketing techniques is the three mm. forms of the game. Mm. Where young players come in, they aspire. The most money is in the T20 yes. side of the game. So they've got to demonstrate to everyone that they can slog. Mm-hmm. They can hit big shots and hit sixes. So yeah. our young blokes are coming into dressing rooms uh, thinking, right, I've got to show them that, yeah, yeah. and then I'll show them my technique later. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's confusing a lot of uh, players and coaches. Yeah. You know, what do you coach your 12-year-old kid? Nowadays, Explosive. you know, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Or the the scoops over your head, or the reverse yeah. sweeps, or do we get balance going? We get get them balanced so that they can then yeah. branch into those shots. That that's a confusing issue. 
Uh, as far as culturally is concerned, I think players these days don't they haven't relied on. Might be just an Australian thing. I'm not sure. They they, they don't rely on camaraderie in the team mm-hmm. um, like we did. We we had to be together. We'd be down in the bar having a little pre dinner drink and then off to dinner a lot together or two big groups going two different spots. Um, they don't do that anymore, um, and. Uh, I think it's probably because they're they're playing for so many franchises around the world. They don't yeah. have to have that camaraderie. They just go in, get a job done or not, and move on. So a, an Australian cricketer, you know, will be playing uh, now against South Africa. He might then not be in the T20 side uh, after being the one dayers. Then he comes into the Test side, and if he doesn't make the Test side, you go to your Big Bash franchise, which. Yeah. It might not be in your state. You might be a New South Wales player, but you're playing for the Adelaide Strikers. Yeah. Um, then, then they come back, play for their states again. Then they go to the Caribbean Premier League, then the IPL, and they're just uh, playing in a lot of teams where yeah. you haven't got enough much time yeah. to develop that camaraderie anyway. And You've got I a lot of different it, mates. Yeah. I think yeah. our state and our national teams uh, haven't mm. haven't uh, noticed that and yeah. haven't engendered it back into those teams when they need to. Yeah. Because there's no really sort of long tours anymore, are there? Like, you don't really go to the Caribbean for 100 days or... Um, uh, what's 100 days? Three, three months. Yeah. yeah, it was always 13 weeks, yeah. our, our tour. Um, it, I'd love to go to the Caribbean for 13 weeks now <laughs> yeah. when the fast bowlers aren't any good. <laughs> yeah. um, geez, that, it was a really uh, stressful 13 weeks over yeah. there where practice facilities weren't great. That probably improved now. They've had a World yeah. Cup and a bit more investment over there. Um uh, practice facility is not great, so if you, if you get behind, and uh, Kirtley and Courtney, or you know they get on top of you, yep. it's hard to get your confidence back. Um, and then our England tour was four and a half months. Yeah, uh, we wanted six. <laughs> yeah, that's a long. Time. That was a great time, you know. And we just you come from where you've come from. Yeah, you know that it was thirty three matches in the nineteen forty eight tour. Um, in England and uh, so they've gradually got it down uh, a little bit and now the players are right behind the, a two month tour rather than yeah. rather than having a four months you know so I, th- I think we could spend some more time expanding some tours for the good of cricket uh, two part question who is uh, the best bowler you ever kept and who is the scariest Right, uh, Warney is the best bowler I've ever kept to. I think possibly the best bowler in the game that there's ever been. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wasn't deceptive. He he wasn't. He couldn't deceive you. Everyone knew what was coming. Yeah. So he was easy to read, um, but it was his accuracy and his relentless uh, passion to be on top of you that was that's perfect. You know, and he could just put the ball where each and every batsman didn't want it. Um, so the, he was the best, the scariest. Oh, you, you mean to keep to the yeah. fastest spell I ever kept to was Jason Gillespie at Headingley. He had a little breeze behind him, and Headingley is downhill, yeah. and we're down off the square as well at the other end. So the balls were really flying, and um, some of the English batsmen didn't like it. He got seven for forty three or seven for forty seven, I think that day. So, so uh, that, that's the fastest. But traditionally, Merv was our fastest and scariest bowler, yeah. and, and you'd hate it when he'd get a wicket because he'd come and slobber all over you, and you just hope, you just hope the catch the catch goes wide and slips, not not to you. You hope someone gets a catch, but if it could not be me, that would be good because yeah, yeah he's all over you. <laughs> so back to Warney, as you said just before, probably one of the best bowlers of, in human history. Mm. What was that? What like? other history is he? <laughs> Human history. Animal history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in modern history, the week the week can document. Um, what was it like watching that happen? Because he was a y- bit younger than you. Yeah. So, did you see? Was there people there managing this young kid who had yeah. it? Like, did you? Did you uh, know, sort you of. Yeah. I, I ring there was, mm. but it was very subtle. It was mm. Bobby Simpson, yeah. the coach, who'd heard about him. Uh, I got dragged into a Queensland cricket coaching office uh, in the early nineties. Uh, our, our coaching director here at Queensland, Toot Byron, said, "Come and have a look at this kid." And it was a West Indies under-19 tour or academy tour or something. And he looked terrible to me. Like, he looked round arm and, yeah. like, he's <laughs> pudgy. And, but it was the vision was quite a fair way away. You couldn't really see it. Um, but they, they said straight away, this fella's real good. <laughs> so, OK. Um, and then when that started to get out and he started to play, Victoria weren't picking him that much because they had uh, Peter McIntyre, Paul Jackson, a few spinners in front of him so 
he was struggling to force his way in there. So they picked him in an Australian eleven to go and play the touring team in Hobart a couple of years in a row. And Bobby Simpson was looking at it. And uh, I was I was the captain of those teams. And Simo really tested him out in the field. He, he found out that he wasn't a great fielder, but uh, certainly started that. Um, and he had a real maturity about him. Like a, he was 20 or 21 probably. Um, and he reminded me of an old-fashioned club cricketer, uh, country club yeah. cricketer. That would put his log cabin can of tobacco down as his bowling mark yeah, and start yeah. from there, yeah. you know. <laughs> and um, so to me, he he was he just felt really old for for how young he was. Um, and then uh, yeah, yeah, so I think Simo was really uh, monitoring him. Then would have been putting some pressure on Victoria to get him in, um, so that you could pick him for Australia. Yeah, well, I did go back the other day and have a look at the highlights from his first game. Uh, in the baggy green against India at the SCG, and he had a pretty bad day. He was uh, he was none for, for 140 odd, I think, uh, in his first innings. <laughs> was it? That was his, <laughs> the end of his first innings. Yeah, right. Like that. And then Ravi Shastri took him for 200 yeah. in the second. Yeah, he dropped then. him, didn't he? He, dro- he dropped a catch. Yeah. So AB said, you keep bowling. You dropped him, you keep bowling. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going, oh, no, do I have to? <laughs> but again, yeah. you'll see his willingness to keep going. Yeah. Uh, we then went to Sri Lanka soon after that, and and he was chirping in the dressing room, like encouraging everyone, and he was getting slogged on the field. You know, yeah, Kalu yeah. with Arana and Arjuna Renatunga just took to him in the in the first innings at, in Colombo, and and he was still encouraging everyone in the dressing room, come on, batsman, good luck out there, you know. Yeah. I was starting to think, mate, you better get your own game going, <laughs> all right, you know. <laughs> but I sort of let him go, and then that second innings of that test, he got three for 11 when Border threw in the ball yeah. to, at the end of a tight finish, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's what he was like. He, he didn't shirk it. He kept bowling, and uh, even if it's none for 140, uh, and and he was always there for others. Uh, very generous in his, in his uh, enthusiasm for others and the team. You know, so you know that's why he's a legend. He is. What do you think he would have done if he didn't play cricket? Well, he was a, a salesman for 40 winks. He reckons <laughs> he used to. He, used to, uh, he, was, he had a blue singlet, you know, like a worker's singlet, yeah, and yeah. drill drill pants, <laughs> and you know sometimes. Have jam from his jam donut on his singlet. Right, <laughs> and then he reckons this is why he was so uh, like, impressed with his part-time job. There's a technique where you can um, get a mattress, a double mattress or even bigger, onto one hand, spin it up and put it on your shoulder yeah. and press the button. You know, press the button and then you're standing there with this bed <laughs> on your shoulder. So, uh, here, I'm here to, develop, to do, uh, deliver your bed. You can imagine it, couldn't you? Yeah. You'd have the big ginger mullet, right. the jam spill on yeah. the blue singlet and the bed on the, bed on the shoulder. Um, yeah, no, that, that's... I, I don't know what he'd do, but I, I reckon he... So th- that means he didn't probably play state cricket, you know. Yeah, so yeah. if he did, so he if he didn't make it in cricket, oh, who knows what what he would do? Poker. I haven't even thought of it, but he would. Yeah, he would have yeah. had, but he wouldn't have had money. No. So so I think at forty winks oh. might have got him. <laughs> he might have found it though. You never know. Um, A boy and from Fern Tree Valley. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and just lastly, what do you think you would have done? Well, I'd done a couple of things already, and, yeah. and uh, I was a school teacher, yeah, right. and uh, so I'd been through teachers' college and taught for three years, mm-hmm. and then I'd I'd left school, uh, left teaching, to go and work with my father-in-law to be, and I'd just started mm-hmm. um, two weeks before this call came to the office that I was in the Australian team. Um, so I was only just sort of starting selling ladies fashion in yeah, a right. fashion agency at South Brisbane, right. right near Brisbane State High. And and uh, sort of we didn't really believe that. I, I You know, I had, my dad had to ring ABC Radio and sort of find out if it was real. Because yeah. I said to him, mate, oh, I'm in the, I've just been told I'm in the Australian cricket team. He said, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd rung ABC to check it all out. The next day there, it was Good Friday. And yep. they didn't need media until that day. Yeah, right. So 
Yeah, it was very interesting. I'd have to sort of unfold that why why even the radio stations hadn't rung me or anything yeah, yeah, in those yeah. days. You know, it was just Queensland cricket rang me to tell me, well, to congratulate yeah. me. Could have been anyone. And then they said, well, yeah, "Have you heard the good news?" No. Yeah, yeah. And oh, yeah, so they had to be careful, you know. <laughs> um, but they waited till the, the embargo and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, right. So I, I then our li- our lives changed. I was getting married in two weeks' time, and um, I was in this fashion business. I, I stayed in it for two more years yeah. after that. And and finally plucked up the courage to tell my father-in-law, oh, look, I'm, I've got to go. Yeah. I'd knock back a sailing trip at Hamilton Island Race Week, you know, with Forex, who are our major sponsor. Yeah. And I got off the phone, ah, oh, that's it. I'm going in. I'm, I'm going in. And I, I went in to see my father-in-law, and he said, oh, God, I thought you would have gone months ago. Oh, Jesus. No. So I left, I left fashion, but I, I reckon I would have dabbled around that, the business world, I reckon. Well, Heel, thanks for talking to us today. Um, all the best with uh, this year. Um, and the, the summer coming up. It'll be a big one. 4K. Yeah. Yeah. 4K, Fox. 4K. 4K. My, I'm, I live in an apartment now. My building doesn't take uh, IQ, whatever, oh, you got, whatever you need to support yeah. 4K. Oh. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get by. It's a, a high-profile summer. Yeah. Great opportunity for the, the blokes to bounce back. That, that, they can uh, produce a team that can win the World Cup at the end of this summer mm. and then go to the Ashes and try to win for the first time in five Ashes series. Yeah. That's yeah. unacceptable. So, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what Langer does differently mm-hmm. and uh, that team plays better in England for once. Yeah, yep. beauty. And Hoppy's Car Wash for anyone in Brisbane. They've got a, a range of outlets uh, around the around the place. Yeah. How we, many you got? We've got a few. We've got 11, a couple down the Gold Coast and uh, mainly around Brisbane and South East Queensland. So thanks for that. All no good. No worries. Thanks, thanks for having us, mate. Okay, boys. And that was Ian Healy. A um, uh, very insightful interview and uh, one that should be getting you excited for a big summer of cricket coming ahead. Yes, hopefully you are one of the 1,221 people that can have Fox Cricket broadcast into their home in 4K. Otherwise, you'll have to stick to being an HD piece of shit like we are out in the middle of the Simpson Desert. And until next week, my name is Errol Parker and never talk to the police without legal counsel present. They are not your friends. They're out to fuck you. Yes, yes, they are dogs, all of them. And uh, my name's Clancy Overall. You be kind to each other. Thank mm-hmm. you.